I, I want to just step back and make some very general, talk about in some very general ways about the world historical situation of philosophy that follows Kant. And so I, I, I was thinking, should I dig into more detail on the metaphysical deduction or the transcendental deduction? That material is there for you. You have the handout. And I'd be happy to talk in more detail about those arguments with you in office hours or indeed next semester if you if you want to get in touch with me. Um, and it actually happens, by the way. Students actually do take me up on that sometimes. So, um, so but I, I thought it would be worthwhile. Uh, and then I was thinking, well, we need to get into Kant's ethics, but I don't want to strap you all with a bunch of reading that I'm not going to be able to cover in any adequate depth anyway. So. I thought, what could I do? Uh, and, and it occurred to me that it, maybe stepping back a little bit and putting a punctuation mark on the whole trajectory of Descartes to Hegel, and then I'll mention Kierkegaard as a little tag along at the end. Um, I think it would be an insult to Kierkegaard to like try to squeeze him into week, like one week here. That would be an absurdity. But I will say a little bit about how he comes out of the German tradition of philosophy that is world historically, so the German tradition of philosophy beginning with Kant, world historically important in both good and arguably horrible ways. So um, my view is that uh, that German idealist tradition was greatly misused during World War II, but you could also argue, as some have, that um, it was sort of already, uh, the sort of nationalism that the Nazis took advantage of was already brewing in the late 17 and early 1800 German thinkers. My thought is that though ideology is always an incomplete, so um, you could virtually take any philosopher and draw some of the things they say out of context to create your own ideology and do all kinds of horrible things with it. Um, Nonetheless, there is a certain uh, seed of German nationalism there. So both very important um, for, for very paradoxical and contradictory reasons. On the one hand, Kant gives us the statement of humanitarianism that we still will abide by today, namely that the individual human being has absolute value that cannot be, um, cannot be transgressed. So if you, if you walk into Ardros Hall, or no, Ardros Forum, and you go to the second story, you'll see the Albert Schweitzer Museum there. And uh, one of the quotes from Schweitzer is, the, the tenet of humanitarianism is that uh, no individual person can be sacrificed for some cause. And that's, that's Kant, right? Kant gave us that idea. That, um, that the human being is the ultimate value and that cannot be used for any means to some other end. But it's a very complex situation. So we get humanitarianism out of German idealism. We get this very robust notion of freedom that leads to the French and American revolutions. But we also get some serious bad things happening with it in, with the rise of Nazi Germany in the, in the 30s and through the 40s. Let's uh, build up the, the situation here. I want to talk a little bit about Kant, but I want to talk about him within the overall trajectory of modern philosophy. And I guess one really simple way to think about what philosophy is doing is it's interrogating this relationship between the self, the world, and perhaps the divine. Certainly, in the roots of philosophy, we may not think that way today, but certainly in the roots of, that, that's only been, the divine has been sort of severed from philosophical consideration for maybe about uh, 50 years. We act like, you know, that's, that's how it's always been. I'm exaggerating slightly when I say 50 years, but it really is um, in its in its um, in its orientation. It has always been 
philosophy has concerned with the divine. And in some ways, that, that, that notion can be deflated. I mean, it, 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 a lot of philosophers just think of this as the infinite. Um, and, and so the initial philosophical attitude introduced by Socrates is a kind of orientation to the infinite. Um, and it, it, it's a, it, the, the ancient Greeks sort of discovered something interesting, uh, that the world becomes extremely perplexing when you start to think about it, when you start to try to resolve ideal mathematical models with what seems obviously in front of you. So we can go through our, we can go through the world in our natural attitude and just think everything is the way I see it to be. Uh, it's obvious there are rocks and trees and stones here so much. What, all I need to think about what practical use those things are for me. But then paradoxes start arising. Um, the Greeks noticed that mathematical uh, truths, when you start trying to formalize mathematical inquiry, even though those mathematical ideas started perhaps in a very mundane way, right? Geometry begins because land surveyors need to know how to divide things up according to specific ratios. And then you start to set down, okay, let's start thinking about those ratios themselves. Let's abstract from the land surveying concern and just try to think about what is the, what are these ratios? And very quickly, mathematicians discovered that when you do that, you run into paradoxes. You run into things that take you beyond the world that you can see. The incommensurability of the square of a, of a triangle with its hypotenuse um, looks very perplexing it's an early mathematical discovery, but it looks extremely perplexing when you try to think about how does this relate back to the world of sense experience. Um, and then you try to apply these mathematical models to something as basic as motion. And what you get is paradox, Zeno's paradoxes. So um, two things happen in ancient Greece. First, the discovery of the, the, the infinite in mathematics and the paradoxical nature of that. It didn't take long. It didn't take us getting to very complicated mathematics. The stuff that you learned when you were in grade school already took us to the infinite. And that was really, really peculiar. And at the same time, the ancient Greeks discovered the notion of a world, right, in the sense of an all-encompassing totality. We never experience any all-encompassing totality. We just experience the fragmentary things around us. Those are obvious, but the all-encompassing totality is not so obvious. So how, do, how does the, the self fit into an all-encompassing totality? That's the birth of ancient Greek philosophy as we know it. Right? Plato's Republic, what is it about? How does the soul fit into the whole? So two very perplexing things happen in ancient Greece. We turn, we, turn, we turn in an orientation towards the infinite and towards the world itself, not just towards the particular things around us that concern us. And that's radically different than everyday life, as it was anyway. This has infused into what we now call everyday life, so it, it, it's hard to work ourselves back into the, the utter mysteriousness of, of Zeno's paradoxes, right? If, if you teach a, an introductory philosophy class and try to do Zeno's paradoxes, people will say, well, I've taken calculus, so I know it's all solved. And you're like, well, let's try to work ourselves back into how mysterious that must have seemed to them. Um, so there's, there's this really interesting thing going on. It seems like it'd be hard to call it a coincidence that at the same sort of Within the same square miles of Earth, the, the infinite in mathematics was discovered and the world was discovered at the very same time. It seems like a hard thing to call a mere coincidence. Maybe it is. Um, but that's where, that's where we found, find ourselves in ancient Greek philosophy. Now, 
The ancient solution to that problem consisted by and large in a kind of idea of the self, the world, and the divine sort of merging into one. The or orgiastic Dionysian mystery cults give voice to this impulse of ancient Greeks. Um, what do you do? Well, you load up on all kinds of strange psychotropic substances and you just see that boundaries dissolve. And indeed, um, that was taken very seriously at that time. Uh, that was something that if you were a prominent public figure, you would be taken to the, the mysteries so that you could witness this dissolution. And the medievals um, start to try to, there's a, a strong uh, influence of the Dionysian mystery cults in Christianity, but as the Latin sort of uh, institutionalization of Christianity takes over, those sorts of mystery cults are considered to be destabilizing. So those are, I don't know if you want to say stamped out or just made less public. Um, they still occur today among, uh, you know, all, all walks of society, but maybe we can say they're made less public. But in any case, the Latin sort of institutionalization of Christianity reduces it all to the divine. So, so that's one you can make is, okay, well, self and world are sort of products of the divine. And that's, that's where medieval philosophy was. Um, from that point of view, since the divine is not only the ground of the causal structure of the world, but also of value, there's no real question about the incommensurability of human value, human existence, and the operations of the natural world. Because these are two things that both come from the very same source. So why would they be incommensurable? That would speak in a heretical way against the wisdom of God if he had done such a thing. So what happens in modern philosophy, but the topic of this course, well, um, the self is focused upon first and foremost. That was Descartes' first meditation. I exist, ego cogito. Ego cogito is the ground for our knowledge of the world and our knowledge of the divine. But God, uh, God remains the causal source of the world and of the self. That's the, the loop that Descartes does. We call this the Cartesian circle. It's the loop Descartes makes from, well, I'm going to start with the self, and I'm going to generate all my categories from there, but I'm, then I'm going to notice that the self is first in the order of knowledge, but God is first in the order of being. So there's this sort of polarity. And... What Descartes didn't anticipate, perhaps, oh, there's different takes on what Descartes really meant to say with his proof of God. Was he trying to satisfy the, um, the censors of the time? I don't think so. I, I, I think, so th think of it this way, right? Um, Descartes was sat trying to satisfy the censors of the time. So he uh, made the subtitle of his book, a proof of God's existence in the immortal soul. Well, that's pretty, uh, especially given uh, it, the situation was very, very different in France, obviously, than it was for Hobbes in Britain, but it seems um, like it's lacking in some kind of intellectual integrity. I think Descartes believed, my personal reading on this is that Descartes believed wholeheartedly in the the course of the meditations. I think that he believed in God's existence and that God would have to play some very important role in uh, our belief in the existence of a material world. But in any case, what, God, what, what Descartes did, um, whether he wanted to or not, was that he made the ego self-autonomous. 
in this scheme. So Descartes unleashes the autonomous ego, but of course God remains a um, object of theoretical reason for Descartes. I mean, we can actually still have proofs of God's existence and we can think of God using the same cognitive apparatus that we used to think about science. The world for Descartes is then reduced to nature. This is what Spinoza is picking up on in a lot of ways. So world essentially becomes nature, not nature as we think of it. Um, well, I, let me erase what I of that. Not nature as it's experienced in the sort of spontaneous life of the individual, but nature as mathematized, inert, extended, realm separate from the ego. So, so a border comes up, right? Because the self, the ego is the unextended thinking substance and nature is the extended unthinking mathematizable realm. So in making the ego autonomous in the establishment of knowledge, Descartes has in some ways severed the the ego and made this the thinkability of this union impossible. That is the union between self, world, and divine. Um, so the, the autonomous ego is unleashed. That's sort of what happens in modern philosophy. The human being as autonomous, free, and disconnected from God. And in a lot of ways, that is. You know, Descartes wouldn't be happy with this, but that's part of the Protestant insistence that we have a personal relationship with God, but we're very different from him. We're, gap, uh, we're separated by an absolute kind of gap. Um, Catholic theologians spent a lot of time trying to close that gap, say, okay, um, even though there's a difference between my being as a finite thing and God's infinite being, can there be some sense in which being the being is something that we still share, me and God? This was uh, Dun Scotus, for example, says being is univocal, meaning there's a, a, a sense of being and existence that we can say of God and of ourselves in the same sense. So that's a theological, it was always a theological problem, but by making the ego autonomous in its knowledge, Descartes separates it off and then separates it off, it seems, even from nature. And the residue of that is the, um, the uh, readiness to see nature as a standing reserve, something to be conquered and used, something mathematizable, something that we can grasp intellectually and therefore manipulate. And, and we're separate from nature. We're the autonomous ego. And that, in many ways, has had the effects that it has had. You, you, can, walk, you can see those all around you, for better or worse. There's a real problem here. If the self is autonomous in its knowledge of nature, then the self is also autonomous in its action. So freedom becomes the guiding thread, especially after Kant. So, so, so that's all Descartes, and now Kant comes in. So Kant essentially agrees with, De, with Descartes about the autonomous ego. So that's what Kant was saying in the transcendental deduction, when he argues that the unification of our knowledge into knowledge, so, well, it, how could we possibly have knowledge of a nature as a whole? We can have knowledge, you know, gray shape in my visual field. These are scattered bits of knowledge. But how do we unify? How can we possibly have knowledge of an entire nature? We can't observe nature as a whole. I mean, even if we launched our rocket ship in outer space, as we do, um, and view Earth as a whole, well, that's far from uh, seeing nature as a whole, right? And so, so, so we can imagine 
well, what if we launched a rocket ship even higher, and this is incoherent, but what if we launched a rocket ship even higher and got a, a view of the universe as a whole? Well, we'd then be in another higher order universe and, and we could re 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 reiterate the problem. So grasping the world or nature as a whole becomes an extremely mysterious problem when the ego is made autonomous. The Kant says that's actually the condition of possibility for that. The, in order to draw all of our um, disparate experiences into a unified, coherent whole, we need the transcendental ego. The Kant calls the self the transcendental ego. Uh, that is, the, that into which all of our knowledge is synthesized into a whole and therefore that which gives us ground for knowledge of nature as a whole. I spelled that wrong. Transcendental ego is the, um, the ground of our knowledge, and it's what unifies all of our syntheses into... So Hume comes along and says, what is knowledge except associating ideas together with such constant regularity that they seem to go together necessarily? Kant turns that into a theory of synthesis, the synthesis of ideas together. Um, we synthesize our experiences together to get a coherent conception of the object. Right? So um, I'm spinning the coffee mug. Those of you on Zoom can't see this well, but I'm spinning the coffee mug around and you're getting lots of different impressions of the mug. And so you're synthesizing all of those together in the experience of one coffee mug. Well, now from a higher order, we need the transcendental ego to synthesize all of those experiences together into one mind. And only by that method can we see how nature as a whole could be known. So that's what's happening in the transcendental deduction that I had you read. Now, the transcendental ego... What Kant makes clear is that this is not the soul. That's the important part. There's a distinction that philosophers hadn't seen between the soul, the self as soul, and the self as constitutor of the appearances. So I'm synthesizing appearances together. That's not me, Professor Bannock. That's me, transcendental ego. My soul is populated with all sorts of other things specific to me. But the transcendental ego is just the universal categories that we all share. So as transcendental ego, we are all the same self. Kant didn't fully draw out the um, implications of that. That would be for the, the German idealists that would follow him. Um, why is this such a problem? Well, if philosophers can only speak as transcendental egos, which we can, if, if Kant is right, we only can speak as transcendental egos. Otherwise, we're speaking from our own personal standpoint of bias. So if the philosopher wants to guide humanity to itself, or if you're Plato, back to itself, the philosopher can't speak from the point of view of well, Professor Bannock wants this, because that's just what Professor Bannock wants. The, the philosopher has to speak as the transcendental ego. But what does that leave? How does that leave the philosopher in a position to guide humanity? Um, that was the problem that the German idealists faced. So for Kant, the result of Descartes' foundation is that the philosopher no longer speaks as the particular soul that he or she is, but rather as the transcendental ego, the representative of the a priori universal categories. Now, to make it work, you've got to reduce nature to a realm of mere appearances, not of the in itself. But the, that's a real problem when you're trying to consider how you cre create a world in the ethical image provided by the philosopher, that is to say, create a, um, a modern nation. 
that was the product, project, at least as the, these thinkers in the 17 and 1800s saw it, of the modern nation, was that it would be the elevation of the mere state. What does a state do? It imposes regulations that keep some modicum of order. The elevation of, uh, the, elevation of the state to a nation, which at that time was considered to be a collective of free egos, autonomous individuals that were all nevertheless collectively oriented towards some higher good. So the autonomous ego can't be separated from nature. That's why Kant reduces the nature to a world of appearances that are generated by the transcendental ego. But that leaves this residue of this dualism between the thing in itself and the appearances. And the, that, that was insufficient for the German idealists following Kant. Particularly because then they thought the problem of morality and, and, and especially collective morality couldn't be solved from Kant's standpoint. Kant locks us back up into the solipsistic individual ego. One thing that Kant find, one thing we can find very interesting in Kant is he still recognizes, well, we've kind of not been talking about this, the divine, for a while now. He recognizes that the transcendental ego has to generate nature through its categories, but it has to be in, uh, um, oriented towards the infinite, towards the divine for morality. So to generate knowledge of nature, we have to generate nature out of our a priori categories. But to then shape nature according to an ethical understanding, we have to be oriented towards the divine. So Kant calls God a postulate of practical reason. We have to believe in God, not because we can know that he exists. We precisely cannot. He is not part of nature. He's not part of the categories that we use to generate nature for ourselves. But he is the fundamental presupposition of moral. So Kant argues that the orientation towards the infinite is what, not what sustains our knowledge, but what sustains our commitment to morality, to an absolute value. But that commitment, since it is just a commitment, must be made freely, or else it's no commitment at all. So we're committed to God's existence. That's what Kant points out. We don't know it. We can't talk about it scientifically, but we're committed to it. And that commitment, as commitment, must be made freely, or else it's no commitment at all. It's merely some kind of mechanical outcome of our nature. So you can see the problem of freedom comes to a fever pitch in Kant, and especially in those following him. Thus, that free choice to commit ourselves to, to God to morality, really, is, is what Kant is getting at. For Kant, religion concerns pious action, not, not knowledge. Um, that commitment to God, uh, that freedom to do so or not to do so, is what Kant finds ultimately valuable. That's why Kant, in his ethics, says... We have to study cases in which there's a clash between our natural inclinations and what we have a duty to do. Because otherwise we don't have any evidence that there is such a thing as an absolute duty. If every duty always corresponds with a desire, I desire to help my friends, because that makes me feel good. Well, then we don't know, we have no way of discerning whether it was the desire that led us to do that or whether it was the respect for the duty, the free choice 
to respect the duty. And that's what Kant finds valuable, is that ability to freely elevate myself above the concerns of my immediate surroundings, my immediate self-interests. The human being is unique in having that capacity. And that's Kant's basis for humanism, the human being as capable of elevating oneself in that way is the absolute value. So he says the categorical imperative is never treat another human being as a mere means to your own ends, but always as an end in themselves, something of ultimate value without any qualifier. Oh, it's valuable because they're an engineer and they contribute to society or because they clean up their litter. No, they're valuable because they're a human being and there's absolutely nothing that can take that away. The very real downside of that is that in Kant, we get, I, th I think, in the history of philosophy, the first entry into a conception of freedom that's genuine and genuine in this sense that it could actually be pushed in the direction of evil. There isn't a guarantee that our free choices are going to work out. Things could actually go horribly wrong. There's no deus ex machina waiting to save the day when we do things, when we screw things up. It's a genuinely terrifying conception of freedom and one that um, we don't want to face up to in many cases. And that becomes extremely concrete after Kant, both in the French Revolution and the terror that followed, as well as in the world wars of the 1900s, where the project of, the mod of modern philosophy initiated by Descartes is often seen to come to an end. So the French Revolution gives, seems to be to many of these philosophers watching it, the embodiment of everything they had been saying the free individual, the necessity of orienting a nation towards an absolute value rather than be remaining on the level of political strategy and other sorts of Machiavellian pursuits. But then we get Napoleon and that perplexed a lot of philosophers. The work wasn't done. Napoleon then starts to conquer Europe, and um, the French Revolution seems to have given way to a new kind of totalitarian world spirit. Of course, Hegel will look at that and see it as ultimately things going in a somewhat of a correct direction because of Hegel's own take on this. We'll get to that in a moment. Hegel is famous for having said that Napoleon, uh, when he saw Napoleon ride into Jena, where Hegel was at that time, um, Napoleon was the world spirit on horseback. But if you were committed to the autonomy of the individual and the idea of a nation, then you might start to find this Napoleonic development rather troubling. And in particular, how uh, the, the philosophers seem to have unseated themselves from their ability to, sh to, to do anything about this. Maybe that says a little something about what I asked earlier about why is it that philosophy has become what it, what it has, which is um, something that most people don't take very seriously or, or don't know anything about. It may be the case that philosophers unseated themselves at the very moment where they were, what they were talking about was giving, becoming embodied in world history. So, in particular, um, if the if the if the philosophers had supposedly found the standpoint from which they could speak in a universal fashion, the transcendental ego. The abstractness of the transcendental ego and the concrete freedom of the collective, the polis or the state that was the object of the Republican revolutionaries in the uh, 
French and American revolutions, for example. How does collective mankind, or even a collective nation, even a collective city, orient itself in view of truth? And can't the philosopher lead them there? As, as, I, said, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it was a philosophical breakthrough that you could orient your life towards truth. And that the, the life of a polis or a collective could be oriented towards truth. And there's still something for philosophers to say there, right? We hear about living today in a post-truth world. Think about the deep consequences of what that actually means. Don't just throw that around because it sounds nice. It means that project of orienting yourself towards truth is no longer. Whose interest does that serve? Now, the philosopher de deceits himself from being able to say anything about this when he or she is the mere transcendental ego. So how does the, how do you be both a philosopher and an American or whatever nation it is that you want them. In this case, how do you be a philosopher and a German was what the German philosophers were asking themselves. Insert any nation there. How could you be both? How do you have one foot in, in your own concrete situation and one foot in the universal? And at what point does philosophy pass over to mere ideology? So how does the philosopher reconcile the attempt to obtain a universal standpoint with the very outcome of that attempt, namely the nation or the project of building a nation that goes beyond the coercive political actions of the state to secure genuine freedom at the collective level? How do you reconcile the absolute value of the human being with the need for collective sacrifice in particular? So we see this in the world wars. The need for collective sacrifice. You have to send your son or daughter off to war, or indeed yourself, for the sake of something larger than you. What happened to the absolute value of the individual then? So what we end up with in the outcome of all this theorizing is the reiteration of Plato's original problem for philosophy. How, do you, how does the individual orient oneself in, in a harmonizing way with the whole? And the modern problem of freedom actually exacerbates Plato's problem, as I hope to have gestured at it a little bit here. The concrete absolute value of the human individual, the need for collective sacrifice. I mean, it's a it's a struggle that you know, even if you if you mundaneize it a little bit from the situation of a war, um, this is something that you struggle with in your everyday life. We talked about the problem of the um, the rational actor in a vacuum, then in the aggregate becomes part of an immense unjust problem. So we are, one way to think about what's going on in the United States right now is we are not, we have no understanding in the United States of how to reconcile our absolute individuality with collective good. And part of that is because how do you motivate, this is the, per, the perennial paradox, how do you motivate um, Someone says sacrifice their life or sacrifice even a bit of convenience. We can't even get people to do that anymore. Sacrifice a bit of convenience for the sake of something uh, that's, that's better for the whole. Um, we're struggling with that problem in the United States. Now, uh, The traditional response to that problem is one that we now find abhorrent because of World War II, which is the blood and soil solution. Well, you, you have to make people very aware of the contingency of their origin. 
that they were born into a particular ethnicity, a particular geographical region. And it's that ethnicity that gave them what it means to be who they are, and that you have to give that back in the form of sacrifice. Again, sacrifice of your life at war, sacrifice of purchasing something a little bit more expensive and not getting it a day later on Amazon, whatever the, the sacrifice is that you see manifesting itself that you're not making and that you know you could be making. Um, how do you get people motivated to do that? Well, the blood and soil solution was, that's what led, so I'll talk a little bit now about Fichte, Fichte was, was living in the early 1800s, so not, he was looking at the aftermath of the French Revolution, and he was looking at um, his own set of wars, not World War I or II, but a similar question occurred. So Fichte has this interesting, Fichte is a post-Kantian German idealist, he has this interesting um, complexity in his thought about the, the, the way to solve this problem, which is that he gives us a very cosmopolitan idea about what it is to be a nation. For Fichte, what it is to be a nation is to share a language, to be able to speak to one another with a shared set of assumptions. So that's very cosmopolitan. That is to say, anyone can learn the language and enter into that nation. But then you have this problem about how you get people sacrificed for it. Um, and, and so that's where Fichte had to turn to, to the blood, that you are, you have a genealogy, a German genealogy, and you have to give that, that's made you what you are, and that's, that's something that you also might have to give back. And that, again, that part of Fichte's address to the German nation was taken out of context. So say what you will about that, but it is a deep problem. How do you get people to sacrifice? You either lead them to a point where they have nothing to lose, right? Which is why, in some ways, a, a useful strategy for a military is to maintain a class of poverty in its nation. The nation, as it, from that Machiavellian standpoint, has an interest in making sure there are people with no options except to join the military. Um, but that's probably not going to do the trick in terms of uniting a nation. Once you get vast wealth inequalities, you start to, the, the very hierarchy that sustains those wealth inequalities destabilizes itself. We're seeing that, again, in the United States. So, so it's a deep problem in the United States. We don't have a shared blood. And that's a great thing, but it's also a real problem in terms of how do you then go about motivating people to actually have the visceral experience of being um, not only an autonomous ego, but also part of a, a, a collective that's and and not not feel alienated from that collective. The, we have a serious problem of alienation in this country, and it's not clear how you would solve that. Right, and, and we don't want to go the blood and soil route for sure. Obviously, we've seen where that leads. No one's suggesting that. But the, the philosophers following, following Kant wanted to know how to get philosophy back in a place where it could actually speak to this kind of issue. So Fichte um, says, well, Kant correctly identified that, well, another way to put the point is, how do you, how do you both have, a, have a, a free ego and yet one that's willing to give up itself for, for a cause that, that will freely choose? That's the point, right? We don't want to, that's the problem with the strategy of keeping people poor. Well, then you can sweep them up into your military, but then that's not really a free choice on their behalf. So how do you get the free ego to choose to give itself into a whole and dissolve itself there? Um, well, um, 
Fichte says that, um, well, maybe since we're, we're running low on time, I'll skip straight to Hegel on this. Um, so your, your two minute Hegel, folks, for the, for the course is, well, um, the, there is no transcendental ego. And the, uh, Descartes, uh, for Hegel, Descartes' autonomization of the ego was a mistake to begin with. The, um, all of these categories, self, world, and divine, are actually part of a more self-sustaining whole, which Hegel calls Geist, which is uh, German. And there really is no English equivalent. So it, it is sometimes uh, translated as, as spirit, but that's really inadequate um, because a lot of people have a hard time understanding what the difference would be between a soul and a spirit. And Geist is, is, is in German, essentially collective. So it's not the Geist of any individual. It's the Geist of a whole. And it's the self, typically, for, certainly for Hegel and, and typically in German thought, Geist is, has some kind of self-standing quality. That is to say, it's not propped up by anything else. It arises from the observation that the, the cultural properties of things that lead to the very problem of freedom that we've been talking about are not reducible to natural properties. So Geist is this thing that encompasses both the self and nature, and for Hegel, even the divine. So you aren't an individual ego, according to Hegel. You are a moment in the over our overarching development of the world as Geist. <laughs> Kierkegaard criticizes Hegel for that in the fine. Here's your 30 second, Kier, there's your two minute Hegel and your 30 second Kierkegaard. By making the individual a moment of an all encompassing Geist, Kierkegaard says Hegel has lost sight of what Hegel was himself was a Protestant Christian, thought himself to be speaking from that perspective. Maybe hard to tell, right? When philosophers just try to say they're religious when they're really atheists, not, not totally clear. But Kierkegaard is himself very religious and says Hegel, in his attempt to, um, to overcome the problem of freedom by making the individual a moment of an overarching geist, lose a sight of the genuine kernel of truth in Protestant Protestantism, which is um, that we're in, that precisely that we are in this paradoxical situation in which the finite ego is absolutely separate from God, and that we establish a relationship to God through our own individual person, not through any kind of collective. So Kierkegaard was very suspicious of collective forms of worship. He said, the church is nothing more than a hooting carnival, and by church he meant the thing, the people that just kind of go blindly to church every day is nothing more than a hooting carnival where you will certainly lose yourself, not find it. Um, and worries that Hegel brings us back to the Dionysian mystery cults in which all we can hope for is a mystical union of with God through uh, through orgiastic festivals. Okay. <clears throat>